Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar sponsored by Merck Animal Health entitled EPM, the Master of the Sky. My name is Mandy Alexander, and I am the moderator for today's webinar, as well as the marketing and instruction coordinator at the Pony Club National Office in Lexington, Kentucky. We encourage everyone to send in questions via the chat box during the webinar, and we'll have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. We would also like you to know we are recording today's webinar. The video link will be posted on the webinar page on our website within 24 hours. Keep in mind that you may need to download some additional software to view the recorded presentation. Today's webinar will be presented by Dr. Wendy Valla. Dr. Valla joined Merck Animal Health in 2004. In her role as Associate Director of Life Cycle Management, she is a driving force behind the company's research and development efforts for the horse. She completed her internship and medicine residency at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine, New Bolton Center, and was instrumental in developing the neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit at the institution. During her time in private practice, Dr. Valla served on staff at two large equine referral practices in New Jersey. Dr. Valla has been a guest speaker at countless veterinary and horse owner meetings, authored many research papers and book chapters, as well as serving as section editor for several books. Once again, please feel free to submit your questions to the chat box. We will have that Q&A session at the end. We do appreciate everyone participating in our webinar today, and we encourage you to take our short survey at the end of the presentation. Take it away, Dr. Valla. Well, good morning, or good afternoon, evening, everyone. I don't know where everybody is listening from, but I'm here in western Wisconsin, and it's about uh, 15 degrees below zero. So um, we are experiencing the first Arctic blast of winter. And I'm here to share with you some information about a disease that many of you um, may or may not be familiar with, but it's equine protozoal myeloencephalitis, often known by three letters, EPM. And I'd like to, at the presentation, talk about how do you recognize this disease and differentiate it from other things like lamenesses and other neurologic disorders, and then how do you treat the disease? So if we move to the next slide, hopefully at the end of this presentation, you'll know something about the cause of EPM, what it looks like, or the clinical signs in your horse, how it's transmitted, how does your horse acquire the disease from nature or its environment, what, which horses are most at risk for developing clinical signs, how do we as veterinarians try to make a diagnosis so we truly the cause of what we're seeing, and then how do we treat this condition, what's the likely outcome, and are there any ways that you can prevent your horse from developing EPM in the first place? So if you look at the name, equine protozoal myeloencephalitis. Equine means horse, and of all land-dwelling mammals, the horse is sadly the only mammal that actually develops neurologic disease as a result of this parasite or protozoa. Mammals that we'll talk about, cats and raccoons and, and possums, that can be infected, but they don't show signs. Second word is protozoa, and that is a single-cell parasite. And the most common cause is known as sarcocystis neurona. And then the third word is myeloencephalitis. And if we break that apart, milo means spinal cord, and cephalo means brain, and itis just means inflammation or swelling. 
And so when you put it together, it means it is the cord and the brain of the horse that are affected. And typically, this protozoa causes swelling or inflammation of the brain and the spinal cord. And that's this neurologic signs. Now, talk a little bit more about what your horse might do if it has neurologic disease versus lameness. So one of the biggest concerns with EPM is it is a potentially lethal or fatal disease. Some horses, when they develop EPM, may develop such severe signs that they never return to normal. They may have difficulty getting up or doing just a normal activity. So it can be a devastating disease. It's relatively uncommon. When it hits, it can be a career-ending disease. It affects the brain and the spinal cord. It's caused by a parasite, which is also known as a protozoa, Sarcocystis neurona. A less common cause is called Neospora husi, but really we'll focus on Sarcocystis neurona. This parasite only completes the entire life cycle in one animal, and that is the possum. And that possum becomes infected. It's only in that organ in the possum that Sarcocystis neurona develops all the way into an adult and begins laying eggs, and those eggs are then shed in the manure or feces of the possum. And so it completes its whole life cycle. Just as an egg, it kind of develops in the possum, grows on to be an adult, and then shed eggs, sheds eggs again. So only the possum can infect horses. Other animals that become secondarily infected, but only the possum has the ability to infect a horse. Horses become infected accidentally when they're out on the pasture grazing, and they're grazing where possums have defecated. Or they're eating hay that was harvested off a pasture where possums that were infected were defecating and leaving feces behind. So kind of that magical combination are horses plus possums on pasture, or I've got a barn where I don't protect my grain or I don't protect my um, hay bales and I maybe feed my cats in the aisle and I leave lights on at night. And what's that do? It attracts possums into my barn and then occasionally possums will defecate on hay or bedding and infect horses that way actually in the barn. So while many horses live in areas of the country where there are possums, probably two-thirds, three-quarters of the United States have possums somewhere um, in nature. Many horses will be exposed either by grazing on pasture or eating hay, but only a very small percentage will actually go on to develop disease. And there are some risk factors then that decide which horses once they are exposed, will actually develop disease. It's difficult to know if a horse has EPM because no two horses show the same set of signs. EPM has been called kind of the master of disguise. It can mimic a lot of other diseases. It can begin as very subtle signs. And you might think your horse is just not wanting to bend, not wanting to collect. I go into a canner, and maybe cross canners, and we'll pick up a lead. And then I notice, you know, he's not you know where his legs are. Or maybe he starts to stumble or scuff his toe. Or maybe he seems like he's leaning and doesn't have a good sense of balance. As the disease progresses, it becomes pretty obvious that 
your horse doesn't really know where his legs are, or maybe he develops a head tilt. But sometimes the early signs can be mistaken for a number of other problems, including a lameness issue. Once a horse is infected, the majority will show improvement if treated quickly, but many will never fully recover. Now, they may recover enough that they can go back and do whatever they were doing before. They can do pleasure classes. They can do dressage. Many of them can go back and become hunters, jumpers. Where we often see a problem are racehorses, where every fraction of a second matters. And so a high-end racehorse may never go back to that same split-level um, performance that they had before EPM. The other problem is once we treat a horse for EPM, they seem like they have recovered. We put them back into heavy work or exercise or showing, and many of those will experience a relapse, and they will again show signs of EPM. So it is a difficult disease to diagnose. Once a horse has contracted the disease, it may be a long road to getting them back to full health. Common signs that we associate with the disease, we say it's the three A's, asymmetry, ataxia, and atrophy. And asymmetry means unbalanced. So one side doesn't look like the left side. And that goes along with no two horses look the same. So I might have a head tilt, like you see the horse on your screen here. His head is tilting to one direction. It may tilt to the left, and then he might actually have a right-sided ear droop, or maybe he has a left-sided eyelid droop, and maybe he's dragging his right hind leg and scuffing his foreleg. So again, the left side doesn't look like the right side, the head, have a left tilt, um, a right-sided ear droop, and so they're asymmetrical. Ataxia means an unsteady or stumbling type of and Really, they don't know where their feet are. They might walk in a fairly level gait on flat surface, but then if I walk down a hill, if I walk over um, maybe a, a sill going into the barn, they may stumble or actually knuckle. And that means that they don't have fine-tuned movement of their feet. Other horses may be so severely affected, they walk like they are drunk or half asleep. And they may actually stagger from side to side. They may appear quite weak. They may actually have trouble getting up if they do lay down. And then the third A is atrophy. And many horses will experience sudden loss of muscle. So if I stand in front of my horse or behind my horse, and I say behind my horse, I see a nice rounded uh, croup or back end. And you can look at this horse. This side looks normal on the right. And on the left side, it's almost dished in and caved in because he's lost all of his muscle mass on that side. And that's very common with EPM. And it could happen on the muscle over his rump. It could happen on one, muscle, one side of his withers. It might happen on one side of his neck. It could happen on one side of his cheek. So wherever there is muscle, I could see atrophy. So asymmetry, unbalanced, ataxia, that staggering, stumbling gait, and then atrophy, a sudden loss of muscle mass. We also see what we call cranial nerve deficits. And typically, if I look at a horse's head, I might see a change in what we call the muscles of expression. So I might see an droop, or his tongue may hang out one side of his mouth. His ear may droop to one side. He may have trouble swallowing, coughing after eating. 
exposed. These are all signs that the nerves innervate the muscles of the face and the muscles of swallowing and tongue tone may be affected. And then again, ataxia or incoordination, they lose that voluntary control, and then muscle atrophy. So a wide variety of signs, and you can probably imagine no two horses will have exactly the same set of signs due to EPM. Horses become infected they are grazing. They unintentionally happen to take a mouthful of grass that also contains feces from an infected possum, or they are being fed hay that has been harvested off a pasture that was infected by possum feces. And so it's by accident they become infected. Only organism, the only animal that can infect a horse is the possum. They shed eggs in their feces, and the feces then are ingested by the horse. Now, occasionally, other animals will also eat feed that's contaminated with possum droppings. And that includes cats, like barn cats, skunks, raccoons. And if you live in Texas, maybe oranges. But when those animals ingest the organism, it only develops so far. And it tends to wall itself off into little nodules in the muscles. And those are called sarcocysts that develop in the muscles of cats and skunks and raccoons or armadillos that happen to have been infected. Those animals do not show any signs. They don't show asymmetry. They don't show incoordination. They don't show muscle atrophy they appear perfectly normal. The only way that they are a risk to infecting or perpetuating the cycle is when those animals die, and they die in nature, if a possum eats the carcass. And possums, they will eat meat, they will eat berries and fruit, they will eat cat food, they'll eat just about anything. But if they happen to eat an animal that's been infected, and they eat the muscle, then the possum becomes reinfected again. And so that's how the cycle completes itself. So we call it the definitive host is the possum. Only it affects your horse. Intermediate hosts are raccoons, skunks, cats. They do not infect your horse they can become infected with the organism in their muscle when these animals die in nature. If a possum were to eat the carcass, then the possum becomes reinfected. And the horse, when it accidentally ingests those eggs shed in possum manure, the horse, unfortunately, can undergo infection of its brain and spinal cord and develops neurologic signs. The horse is what we call a dead-end host. The horse never sheds any eggs in their manure, and one horse with EPM cannot infect any other horses. So it's a one-horse disease. You're not going to see an outbreak in the sense that one horse infects many others. The only way you see multiple cases on a farm is they became infected on the pasture or with the hay that was contaminated by the possum. So horse ingest sporocysts or eggs from the possum could come in their pasture, in their feed, in the barn, defecated around the feed troughs, defecated around the water troughs, or in their hay. Parasites will multiply in the horse's intestines once it's been ingested, and then it infects the horse's blood cells, particularly the white blood cells. And then once it gets into the blood, the organism can circulate throughout the horse's system, and a very, very small percentage of horses will become infected, and the organism 
will cross what we call the blood-brain barrier and infect cords and um, brain. The sad part is, if we don't diagnose this organism will actually kill nerve cells. And so some of the damage can be permanent and irreversible. Sometimes if we get to it soon enough, all it has done is really begun to infect nerve tissue and caused a lot of swelling, but it hasn't killed those nerve cells yet. So early diagnosis is critical. But once we start to see destruction of nerve cells, we can have that wide variety of, of neurologic deficits that I described, the, the ataxia and the muscle loss. And what you're seeing here in this lower right-hand corner is actually an extension through a horse's spinal cord. And normally, it should also be white. And these pinkish red areas are the trauma that this parasite has caused to a horse's spinal cord. And all of these areas of bruising or trauma means that it has damaged a nerve that is going to a muscle, telling that horse's leg how to move, or an ear how to flick, and that's how we, we start to see the neurologic deficit. So the possum sheds eggs in its manure. Those eggs might be eaten by a barn cat, a skunk, a raccoon. These are known as intermediate hosts. The organism walls off, and this is a picture of muscle, and this is what the organism looks like in the muscle tissue. And those animals remain normal, and they only pose a problem if they die in nature and the possum eats them. Then the possum is reinfected again. Now, in the case of the horse, if they ingest those eggs or sporocysts, a very small percentage of horses will become infected as far as their brain and their spinal cord. And once that happens, you see the asymmetry, the ataxia, and the muscle loss. We only see EPM wherever there are possums and horses. And possums are actually only found in North and South America. Um, so we don't see it as a primary disease in, say, Europe or China or India or even Australia. And if you look at the United States, the colored areas, particularly the dark purple areas, are some of the most common habitats for possums. And they are moving a little bit, Possums continue to move into other sections of the country, but that dark purple area is where the pastures are most likely to be contaminated. But remember, if I grow hay in those purple areas, and then hay is shipped to other parts of the country and fed to horses, I can see this disease in areas of the country where I don't necessarily have a lot of possums on my pasture. The most common time of year for us to make a diagnosis is during the warmer months. So late spring into summer into fall, which figures, that's when possums are out and moving around, maybe up close to the barn, uh, in the horse's pasture. I might see it wherever I have my hay storage wide open so wildlife can come in at night and potentially defecate on it. If I've got woods around my barn, that just means possums like woods. They like protection. So if I've got wooded areas close to my pastures or barns, I may be more likely to see possums. Living with cats, and that doesn't mean cats are bad. It just means if cats have become infected and if cats die and are eaten by possums. So don't, don't go get rid of your barn cats because barn cats alone are not bad. Um, it's only if they become infected, they die, and a possum actually eats them. If I've had a history on a farm, 
of other horses coming down with EPM, that's a risk factor. That kind of convinces me that possums, I've got pastures that have been infected by possum droppings because other horses have actually become infected. And then this next uh, item is very important. I mentioned that maybe a whole herd of horses might be out on a pasture. They're all exposed. They all ingest some possum droppings, but maybe one out of 50 or 100 horses ever comes down with the disease. And we think one of the risk factors is stress. If you are tired, overworked, you've had maybe undergone long, long distance transportation, that's a stress on your immune system. And it means you become more susceptible to things that you might normally have been resistant to. And so we often find that a horse that has recently been diagnosed with EPM has been under some recent stress. They just shipped in from a long distance. They have been under heavy, heavy training schedule. Or maybe they've been laid up and stall rested with a totally different problem, uh, another illness that is also uh, stressing them. Another risk factor, horses that are used for racing or showing or other performance ventures, uh, exercise represents a stress. And then we tend to see it in middle-aged horses, two to five years old and even older. We rarely see it in foals or weanlings or yearlings. So some type of stress suppresses our immune system, and that's really what provides us with resistance against viruses like colds and bacterial infections but it also protects us from developing EPM. And so you see a few pictures here of thoroughbred racehorses, standard bred racehorse, um, maybe a hunter jumper, dressage horse, horses that have been on a long distance transportation. All of those things could be a stress factor and might make them more susceptible to coming down with EPM. Riding discipline, so racing, western performance horses, any horse that's in heavy training potentially could be at increased risk because of that stress-related pressure of their immune system. And then I mentioned living with cats, but don't blame the cat per se, only if they reinfect the possum. And not a young, young horse disease. They usually have to be mature horses uh, older than two years of age. Now this is a map of the United States, and we talk about seroprevalence. And what that means is any time your horse is exposed to a disease, they develop antibodies. And sometimes those antibodies in their bloodstream help protect them from that disease. Those antibodies also act as a marker. They tell us that the horse has indeed seen the disease and maybe mounted a very good response. So what was done recently is they sampled blood from horses around the country to see if in certain parts of the country, horses were far more likely to have antibodies against EPM or Sarcocystis neurona or Neospora husi. And if you look, if you live in the West, you've got probably the lowest exposure rate 68% of horses were positive with antibodies against Sarcocystis neurona, and that's the protozoa that causes the disease. If I look in the Northeast or the South, I've got 82 or 84% of horses are positive. So risk of exposure based on antibodies, the national average is greater than 80%. So there's a lot of exposure to possum feces, whether on the pasture or the hay, but only a small percentage, maybe 1% or 2% of horses, will actually come down with clinical disease. Now, there are other causes, though, for neurologic disease, for horses that don't know where their feet are or walk like they're 
almost drunken or asleep, the incoordination. And some of the diseases that we need to rule out, one is wobbler disease. And you're seeing an x-ray here. And this is actually the horse's head is up here. And these are two of the bones of his neck. And sometimes what we'll see is a change in those bones of the neck that surround the spinal cord. And they'll put cord compression, or they'll put a squeeze on the horse's spinal cord. And that horse will act like he doesn't know where his hind legs are. And we call that a wobbler syndrome. And that obviously has nothing to do with EPM or parasites. The next thing on the list, WNV stands for West Nile virus. And that's a disease that's carried by mosquitoes. And that, too, can cause a variety of neurologic disease or signs. The next one, EEE or WEE, is equine, either eastern or western, encephalomyelitis. And that's a mosquito-borne disease as well. And that can cause a lot of brain signs in horses. The next one, EHV1, is equine herpes virus 1 virus. And that virus can cause an acute onset of neurologic disease, typically affecting the hind legs. And then, of course, everyone knows about rabies. Horses can be bitten by either rabid bats or rabid animals. And that can produce a wide range of signs. And you might have heard about Lyme disease. That's carried by ticks. And a very rare occurrence is the development of neurologic disease after the bite of an infected tick. And then, of course, trauma. You know, horses go out there and play and run hard. Um, they may be spooked. They may run into fences. And if they seriously injure their brain or spinal cord, they could also be mistaken for a horse with EPM. So how do we diagnose it? It may look like a lot of other diseases, but we do a neurologic exam. We want to watch the horse walk in a straight line, turn tight circle, see if he knows where his feet are, if I back him up, if I circle him quickly. I may pull on his tail to see if he can catch himself from side to side. We do a very critical exam of their head. Does he have an ear droop? Does he have a head tilt? Does he have problems swallowing? Does he have good tongue tone? If I tug on his tongue, can he pull it back in his mouth? Those are all things that would go into a neurologic exam. And then we rule out some of the other diseases I mentioned. But the best way to confirm EPM, one is take a blood test. So we're looking for antibodies. That tells me he's been exposed. Doesn't mean he's, been, he's showing signs. The next is. CSF, that is cerebral spinal fluid. And to get that, I usually have to put a fairly long needle into the fluid that surrounds your horse's spinal cord. And then we test that for antibodies against EPM. And then another way to diagnose the problem is if I start a horse on treatment that is specific for EPM and it's better, and chances are he had EPM. Otherwise, he wouldn't have improved. Now, just kind of want to show you areas where we get spinal fluid from. Typically, we'll sedate your horse and put him in stocks, and then go in with a 5 to 6 inch needle. And we will insert it right back at a very, very specific spot on one of the highest points of your horse's croup. And if I were to look down on the bones of your horse's back, so if I were to be kind of hanging over your horse, looking down right here over his back, and then I look down at the bones, here are the bones of his back and sacrum. And right here is a tiny opening. That's where I want my needle to go. And I will pop in to the space around the spinal cord and draw off some fluid. And that's what you see this veterinarian doing here is with a long needle and a syringe drawing up off what should be clear fluid. 
The other place we can get spinal fluid is if we lay the horse down and anesthetize the horse, kind of put them to sleep temporarily, there is a spot right here on the base of their skull that we can also go in with a needle and draw off fluid. And then there are several tests on the market. One's called IFAT, another's called SAG234, another's called Western Blot, but they are all assays that we use to try and make a diagnosis of sarcocystis neurona, the cause of EPM. And this just shows you again, this is a really a seven inch needle, so most of it is well beyond the back of the horse, down into that tiny little spot, drawing off fluid. We always want to be careful when we're drawing fluid that we don't contaminate it with blood cells. Because if I contaminate my sample just by poking tiny little vessels, I won't be able to tell if the antibodies are actually from the spinal fluid or if they're from um, the blood cells that I got into my sample. Now there are three treatments that the Food and Drug Administration has licensed for use in the horse to treat EPM. One is Protozel, and that's our product at Merck. The other is Marquee, and the other is Rebalance. And Protozil is a pellet that you put on top of your horse's feed. Marquee is a paste that you have to administer orally every day. And Rebalance is a liquid that you also have to dose every day. So if we look at Protozil, and this just shows you a small scoop. You don't give very much, um, but you give it every day for a minimum of 28 days. A very effective treatment. I don't have to give a high dose at the beginning. I just have to give about a small scoop. And you can see here somebody's fingers, you know, right around that scoop. Uh, it's a very small scoop. It's alfalfa pellets that have the drug uh, contained within, and so most horses readily consume it. Marquee is a product that has to be given with a large paste gun once a day, again, for a minimum of 28 days. And then Rebalance is a liquid suspension, usually a fairly large volume that you need to give every day for up to three to nine months. And so Rebalance, um, you must give over a much longer period of time. And sometimes it can have side effects uh, that, can, that may be bad. It can suppress the horse's bone marrow uh, so that they don't make good cells. So Protozil is the product we have. You give it as the small scoop up there on the right. It tastes like alfalfa pellets. You give it once a day for a minimum of 28 days. It has a very good safety margin. And almost 70% of horses, if treated early enough with Protozil for EPM, will improve pretty quickly. But remember, a number of horses that have EPM um, may not improve fully. Uh, about less than 30% of horses that are treated are going to recover completely. And so it's really important that you pay attention when your horse doesn't seem to be moving right, if he's stumbling, if he seems to be just clumsy. Ask your veterinarian to come out and give him a physical and a neuro exam. Because if he's showing early signs of EPM, the sooner we can begin treatment, the more likely you are to have a good outcome. A lot of horses, even though they may, may reach one, two, three months later when they're going back into work, they may show again of EPM. So how do you the disease? They will just prevent possums from coming into the pasture, but you know, as we all know, possums roam pastures at night. Um, they're sneaky. They're hard to keep out. Um, they can go under fences. They can wander into your barn, at, especially if you're putting down food for your barn cats. Feed your barn cat in a high area, a protected area, maybe in your uh, tack room, but don't put down 
cat food, um, like you know, dry kibble or canned cat food, it's the biggest attractant for possums and even raccoons. Minimize, you know, adverse uh, health events. Try not to overstress your horses. If you're putting them into work, give them a break. Don't uh, push them too hard. Um, if they've got to ship a long distance, give them the other end to, uh, so that they're not stressed. And sadly, there's no disinfectant that you can go through your barn with that will kill all of these sporocysts that carry the sarcocystis neurona. So kind of in summary, this is has has the to be a very debilitating disease. It affects the central nervous system of a horse, most commonly the brain and the spinal cord. It's caused by a single cell protozoa, Sarcocystis neurona. Only possums can infect horses by either contaminating their hay, their grain, or their pasture. And to make a diagnosis, we do a neurologic exam. We watch how the horse moves and is he stumbling? Does he have a head tilt? But spinal tap, which means you know, getting a sample of fluid from around the brain and the spinal cord, that long five, seven inch needle, and going in right at the highest point of the back or maybe anesthetizing your horse, laying your horse down, and getting a sample right at the back of the head. Treatment. Likely we are to have protozil is the one treatment that Merck offers, easy to give. It's a minimum of 28 days. I put a scoop once a day on top of my horse's grain. Very palatable. Horses like that alfalfa flavor. Um, and sometimes your horse might need an even longer course of treatment if we don't think they have fully uh, responded. Many horses are often exposed. I mean, every horse out on pasture is probably exposed to where the possums have been, but only a small number develop clinical disease. Remember, stress often plays a factor into why one horse comes down with the disease and not others. And it's critical that we get a good and accurate diagnosis and we start that treatment early. And protozil, if you do have a horse that uh, is diagnosed with EPM, it's a very safe product, it's very effective, easy to give because it's scoop of alfalfa flavored pellets, and it's one of the most cost-effective treatments that are out there. Back of it. And this just shows you some of our team at Merck. Um, many of us have horses of all different flavors, from backyard uh, pleasure horses, Appaloosas, quarter horses, dressage, you know, warm bloods. Uh, some have also been involved in the racing industry, but we like what we do. And um, remember, all horses are potentially at risk if they live in a region where they're going to come into contact with possums. And I just had to put a few pictures up of some of my Labrador retrievers. So uh, up here on the farm, I'm in western Wisconsin. Uh, we've got five Labradors and one Border Collie. We've got plenty of beef cattle. We've got horses. We've got chickens. and We've got possums. So even up here where it gets bitter cold, uh, we see EPM. And so with that, I open it up to any questions you might have, either about EPM, neurologic disease. OK. Whatever questions. I've got, a, I've got quite a few already for you. OK, so uh -oh. the first one. All right. um, <laughs> um, Good questions, though. They're, they're good questions. I was, I was trying to catch anything that I could. I was like, oh, I can't answer these. <laughs> um, will the treatments listed also treat the secondary type? And I'm not even going to try and say it because I will butcher it. <laughs> oh, Diaspora? Yes. Yeah. I mean, the other yeah. organism that causes, yes. We, um, 
Although the work has all been done with all of those products, Protozil, Marquee, and Rebalance, it was all done with Sarcocystis neurona. We believe the treatment would be effective against Neospora. It, too, is a single-cell protozoa, and uh, it, it appears to respond to the same treatment. And that is far less common, but it does occur. So yeah, treatment. OK. Um, the next one, um, and, and I'll kind of combine. i got a couple here that are similar. Um, so does the, does the medication kill the parasite or heal the nerve damage? Is the ah, good, good question. All right. Um, Actually, and I can go back, let's see if I go back to that one slide where I show those different treatments. Um, when it says it inhibits merozoite replication, you can see it says it here under diclasera, it says it here under uh, marquee. That means the organism undergoes different stages of development in the horse. Remember, the horse never sheds any eggs. And these drugs, will inhibit replication. And if that merozoite, or that stage of the parasite, is exposed long enough, we think it eventually dies. And so it takes, though, a fairly long exposure to the drug on a daily basis to prevent that organism from ever surviving and replicating. Um, no medication will not heal nerve injury. And so when I showed you some of the horses that had lost a lot of muscle mass, it's like even an athlete that undergoes nerve injury and loses a really good on one side. Other nerves may develop and grow in and give you secondary, what we call innervation. And some of that muscle It'll come back, but it'll come back through rehab. You need to go out just like and an exercise and do the same exercise over and over again. And that's why I say many horses will go back to doing what they did before unless it requires, you know, absolute maximum performance, like a thoroughbred racehorse. They can't afford to even be a hair off their performance. But I go out even doing dressage. I, if I work hard, I get secondary muscle development. You can go back and recover from EPM. I can go back and, and hunt. I can go back and be a pleasure horse, a barrel racer. Yes, because other muscles will help cover um, the damaged muscle from EPM, but the medication will not heal the nerve injury. Now, if I don't make the diagnosis early on and I have extensive nerve injury, then chances are that horse is going to have a difficult time coming back and performing without noticeable deficits. OK. Oh, boy, they just keep rolling in. you got lots of questions. <laughs> I thought you might when we talked about this the other day. Um, OK, um, this a simple, simple kind of along with that, does frost kill the parasite? Does what? No. Does frost, frost, frost kill the parasite? Yeah. You know, yeah. that's a good question. And I think we know um, it's not just the parasite. The parasite is actually growing and developing in the possum. It's the eggs. So the eggs are shed, or the you know, uh, sporocysts, and they're pretty hardy. And so if they're shed, we suspect that if they're shed in the winter months, they probably aren't ingested by the horse because you've got frost and you know snow, it's bare pasture, you don't have horses out grazing as much, and that's why we don't think we see as much EPM in the winter. It's kind of a combination between possums aren't as active. When they shed any eggs, those eggs are probably covered by frost or snow or the pasture is pretty much gone and the horses aren't, aren't out there grazing. We do think that maybe in the spring, if there are still eggs out there, they might, um, they, they potentially could survive. But no one has done a lot of critical work knowing how cold does it have to get for that egg to be killed. OK. Um, 
And this actually, we think we see a lot. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, it's okay. Keep going. Well, possums, you know, normally are out there foraging in, in the woods. They'll eat roadkill. So, I mean, anything that gets hit by a car, possums will eat anything. They're kind of those garbage feeders, you know. They, they'll eat berries, but they'll also eat, you know, a dead raccoon. Um, and they tend to be eating more of kind of their natural food source in the summer and probably early fall. And we think something else that happens as the weather gets cooler and some of their natural berries and other sources dry up, they move closer and closer to the horse barns and they go looking for an easy meal. And that's where we say, be real careful where you feed your barn cats. It's great to have barn cats. They do a great job, you know, killing mice and they're just great to have around. I've got my own cats that come and go in the house, outside, whatever they want. Um, but be careful where you feed them. And if your barn is open and you've got cans of cat food down or dry kibble down, at least put it behind a closed door where only your cats get it. Otherwise, you will be attracting possums in, and they're likely to be hungrier as the weather gets colder. OK. Um. OK, so this person asked, with early diagnosis being key, um, what should be, what should make you call the vet? Uh, should the horse have all three asymmetry, asymmetry, ataxia, and atrophy, or would you call your vet with just one of the signs? Oh, no, I'd call my vet with just one. Um, while many horses have all of them, I would be calling if my horse has a head tilt, if it looks like he's having a hard time swallowing, if I look at my horse straight on and his left ear looks like it's down and his right eyelid looks a little droopy, I'd be concerned. If I stood behind my horse and I go, or I'm sitting on my horse, this is sitting in the saddle looking down at his shoulders and go, wow, one side looks flatter than the other. He doesn't look symmetrical anymore. I'd be calling. If I think a horse that normally has been sharp, picking up his leads, doing everything you want him to do, and all of a sudden he's stumbling or scuffing his feet or really just doesn't seem to want to pick up a lead, you need to have somebody look at him and decide, is he lame, does he hurt, or does he not know where his feet are? And obviously if he's lame, that's a whole different set of treatments. It could be anything. Um, but if it looks like he doesn't know where his feet are, that's where I say get your vet out sooner than later. And then we do um, a neurologic exam, and we will walk him in a straight line. We'll walk him in kind of a serpentine. We'll walk him up and down a hill. We'll walk him with their head up and their head in a normal position. We'll ask them to circle quickly. We'll pull on their tail to see if they're weak or if they can catch themselves. And then we'll do a neurologic exam around their head and see if they really do have normal you know, nerve function. So any time you think your horse has either lost muscle mass on, on one side all of a sudden for no apparent reason, if he seems to be stumbling or scuffing or just acting like he doesn't always know where his feet are, not picking up a, a lead, um, or if you've noticed anything about his head that doesn't look normal, head tilt, leaning, it's always better to be safe than sorry and have them come out and do a, a physical exam. Okay, and that kind of goes along with that. Um, is there, what point do you feel that a horse that, that you think, suspect might have EPM or does have EPM is unsafe to ride? Well, um, <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> the, the, well, the, bi the, the biggest danger is the ataxia or the incoordination. Even though they want to take care of you, they, they just don't know where their feet are, and sometimes mm -hmm. they'll knuckle quickly and go down. And, you know, here I am. I'm veterinarian, and my big warm blood came down with EPM. And that was a number of years ago. And, you know, I was that typical rider. He was only a four- or five-year-old, big 17-hand warm blood, and he was just learning how to do a lot and collecting, and he's kind of a big kind of gangly youngster. But we'd really been doing well. And, you know, I just got on him a number of times, and he just seemed to 
hate to bend to one side, and then he wasn't picking up his lead, and then he just seemed to be all over the place, like he was almost doing a 4B canner. And I was in denial. I kept saying, oh, he's just having a bad day. Oh, he's just having a bad day. And then, you know, all of a sudden, he tripped and went down. And so if they don't know where their feet are, that's when they become a real danger for you to ride. A, a head tilt or problem swallowing, they're not going to be as much of a danger when you're riding. It's not knowing where their feet are. And particularly yeah. if you're not in a level riding arena, if you're out on a trail, if you're going over uneven ground. And most horses, if treated early, and I said they see 70% improve, um, it, it just all depends. And that's going to be a very critical evaluation that you and your veterinarian are going to have to have is has he recovered enough that I can go back and start working him again? And usually I recommend you start lunging, you start you know, working with him on the ground before you hop back on him. OK. Um, so this kind of goes along with that. Um, someone asked if, if there is a preventative, like a, that they can give the horse. Um, they've had a couple horses at their barn who have um, experience CPM, one who's relapsing, I have another person who's had a horse that has had it a couple of times. Um, they want to know if there's a preventative, and then if if not, if they have a horse that keeps relapsing, um, can they treat more than once a year, and if so, how long, how many times should they keep re-going through the treatment? Oh, I'll <laughs> um, yeah. I will I, I will tell you that we've been very excited about Protozil, um, because we're finding that um, sometimes different doses can be very beneficial, which makes it maybe easier to use um, even after you've gone through the regular treatment course. And so all I can say is we are doing research in exactly the area that someone asked the question. Can I prevent the disease? If I know my horse is going out there on the pasture and there's possums all over the place and they come out at night and I can't possibly get rid of the possums, is there anything I can do for my horse that makes him more resistant to the organism? And so, yes, we are looking at different ways that you might in the future be able to use protozil um, to actually make horses more resistant or prevent the disease even when they're exposed. Now, all of the products I showed you, the Rebalance, the Marquee, as well as the Protozil, um, they can be administered for a longer period of time. Protozil and Marquee, minimum of a month or 28 days. Rebalance works differently, and you see it's three to nine months treatment. But some horses may remain on treatment for two months, three months. Um, some horses will be treated at varying frequency after the first month. And then sometimes when they're about to go back into work or training, they may go back on the medication. Because remember, stress may predispose certain horses to coming down with EPM. And so we're working on that, because I think that's a really good question. And when you look at parts of the eastern United States and southern United States, 80 to 90 percent of horses have antibodies against the organism, which means 80 to 90 percent of my horses have seen and ingested the eggs. And so that means they're at risk. And so if I can find a way to prevent disease by giving them something, that's what we're working on. But right now, there's no other prevention. A number of years ago, there used to be a vaccine it was a conditionally licensed vaccine. It was only on the market about five years. And then it was taken off the market because it never went on to get fully licensed. Um, but you know, there, there is, has been research trying to find a way to vaccinate horses against EPM. But there is no vaccine available now. OK. Um, and there are no generics that you know of currently either, correct? No. and. But that's a good question, because you will hear of other drugs being used to treat EPM. Those three drugs that are listed on the screen now are the only FDA, which is Food and Drug Administration, the only 
FDA-approved licensed drugs. There are drugs out there called compounded drugs or drugs that are used off-label, and I strongly urge that you do not use drugs that are not FDA-approved. In order to be licensed, it means the drug has gone through some rigorous training to show that it actually works and that it's safe. And when you use drugs that aren't licensed, you don't have any of that behind you, and you don't have a big company like Merck that will be there. If you have a problem with the drug or any questions about the drug, the company that licensed the product will stand behind that product. You use a compounded product or something, they say, oh, I heard this works, just give, you know, five days of this or an injection of that, be wary, because chances are if anything goes wrong, there's nobody going to be there to help back up what went wrong, and we're here to help. Okay. Um, this person has heard that vitamin E works well to support um, during and after the treatment. They wonder if you found that to be true, or do you have any recommendations um, on supportive therapies that they can use, uh, you know, in tandem with the medication during or after? Yeah. You know, vitamin E has been used. And a lot of horses we treat for EPM, we put on um, vitamin E. It's been a vitamin that helps with, with nerve, um, I would say, healing. And so you'll see vitamin E used in a number of uh, neurologic diseases in the horse. So it's kind of one of those nonspecific treatments. And I have no problem using vitamin E. Um, there is... Uh, some specific formulas licensed for horse that have a very high um, level of vitamin E in it. Uh, Elevate E, there's one that comes out of Kentucky Research Center. Um, very good product. And yes, you'll see us put horses on sometimes somewhere around 5,000 units a day of vitamin E. And so that's a nonspecific um, treatment to help healing. So yes. Um, other times, if we've got a really severe case, you may also see uh, a horse's initially get some anti-inflammatory treatment. So maybe they'll get some doses of banamine to decrease that acute itis. You know, I said it's equine protozoal myositis, so you get a lot of inflammation and swelling. So they might get sometimes you might see something called DMSO given intravenously. Um, so yeah, there'll be some other uh, acute treatments that might be given just to try and stabilize a really severe case. So yeah, that's a good okay. point. Okay. Um, this takes us back to testing for the disease a little bit. Um, this person asks, are there any risks with the spinal tap, such as irreversible damage? Really, really rare <laughs> any uh, adverse event with a spinal tap if done properly. Um, there's actually a new technique where you can get a sample up right at the, uh, at the sort of the top part of the horse's neck and with a horse sedated and using an ultrasound probe, you can go in and get fluid with them standing. But doing the, I showed you taking the tap with a horse standing mm -hmm. in the stalks and I'm going in at the sort of the highest part of their rump and getting a sample. Um, that's not all that dangerous if they're sedated. So I put back on the slide that horse is sitting in the stocks. I block right where I'm going to go in with the needle, and then the horse is also sedated. So the horse is sedated so that it's quiet, doesn't really feel as much of the, you know, the pain as the needle goes in, and then I put local anesthetic in before the needle is uh, inserted. Now, this other one where you lay the horse down, this horse is out. This horse is sedated uh, with a short-acting anesthetic. They're laying very on the ground because I'm going to put this needle in just below the horse's brain stem, so you don't want your horse moving at all. And the only downside to this technique, it's easy to get a nice sample, but obviously I have to sedate the horse and he has to lay down and I got to get him back up again when he wakes up. And so this newer technique, and I don't have a picture of that, is standing, they're sedated, and then using an ultrasound probe, I take a needle and go to the side of the 
neck way up just uh, not too far behind the base of the horse's skull. And so that's a third way. So as long as it's done properly, quiet setting, adequate sedation, we, we rarely ever have problems. So no, the, the likelihood that we're going to damage or injure the spinal cord is pretty minimal. Okay. Um, and then I had this other one. Um, this, this first one has experienced DPM. Um, her horse did not get an early um, diagnosis, and so he does have some atrophy. She wants to know if, if, and she has done treatment, can treatment still help him further? Or do you think that she's, you know, he probably is what he is? Um, depends how long he's been dealing with the deficits, but I never underestimate the value of, of persistence and rehabilitation. I've known so many horses go back to do great things, but sometimes it's taken months and months to get them back to where they were uh, before they were infected, affected. And remember, when I lose you know, muscle mass and even and people that have undergone nerve injury and, and a muscle is, is atrophied, it takes a while for other muscles to compensate and for you to maybe walk, but maybe with a slightly different gait, but the more you do it, the better you get. Um, but for sure, there are some horses that they've had so much nerve injury, they are probably not going to be safe to ride again. They may not be a danger to themselves out on pasture, but to ask them to carry your weight over fences, down trails, what have you, yeah, some of them will be not able to go back and be safely ridden. Now some have had brood mares that have come in and had foals and yeah they were past EPM cases uh, but now and then remember there are some horses that will not recover. There are some horses that either they're exposed to such a massive dose of the eggs or they are so stressed and immunocompromised that they really just have no defense and so they end up with an overwhelming infection. And some of those horses don't survive. They actually become recumbent, unable to stand. And despite treatment, we've either just too late with the treatment or the damage is just too massive. And so this can be a fatal disease. OK. Um, looks like we've got the most other, of them. This what, yep. The other thing I'll just mention is it can be it can be kind of, um, insidious to hide for a while. And so horses that might have been exposed, maybe they're on the East Coast and been exposed, um, the organism has circulated in their white blood cells, but they've never shown any signs. And then they're bought and they're shipped across the country and end up in oh, Arizona, where there really aren't a whole lot of problems. And months later, the horse will develop DPM. Maybe they were stressed. Maybe they were put into, into, uh, into training. And, and so, again, it's a tricky organism. Uh, we realize a lot of those horses that got exposed and never showed signs, maybe that organism can still be lurking there, waiting later when the horse becomes stressed, and then they develop signs. And we've had reports of horses that have been purchased and shipped out of the United States to places like Europe. They don't have possums. They don't have EPM. And months and months later, a horse will come down with EPM. So it, it's a sneaky disease. And uh, so I like the question about how do we prevent it. And that's what we're certainly trying to work on at Merck. But yeah. it is a miserable disease. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I, that I understand. Um, so I said every time that you 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 answered the question just before I was going to ask it, you a answered the uh, if it could be dormant. So you answered that one. Yep. Um, the uh, this another person that has encountered it as well has had a horse treated uh, about a year ago, and the horse seemed to recover, and then they found it again. Um, they're asking is the horse reinfected or did the treatment not fully, um, you know, rid the horse of the disease? Oh, another good question. Um, <laughs> one of the first things I ask is because, because the disease is so wild and crazy, you know, left ear droop, right sided head tilt, whatever, if 
it is a relapse of an organism that wasn't fully killed, the horse typically shows the same signs it showed when it first came down with the disease. So if I was dragging my left hind leg and I was leaning to the right and maybe had decreased, you know, ear droop on one side or ear droop on one side, those might be the signs you see again when it relapses. That makes me suspicious that we didn't fully kill or eradicate the organism and it was dormant and then became active again in the same area that it was when the horse first came down. Now, the other thing that can happen is the horse seems to fully recover, goes back on a pasture where you know you've got possums, and for whatever reason that horse was more susceptible the first time, he could potentially become susceptible again. We don't think you have any long-lasting immunity once you've had EPM. But typically, if he gets reinfected, he's probably going to have a whole new set of signs. They're not going to be the same signs you saw before. Because of how this organism can just randomly cross over and infect the spinal cord, they're probably not going to infect the same part of the spinal cord you know, each time. So if he shows the same signs he had initially, I'm suspicious we never eradicated the infection fully. If he comes down with a, a different set of signs compatible with EPM, then I'm suspicious he was reinfected. Okay. Um, is there a way to know that the tree, uh, that the the parasite is completely gone, killed? I wish. No, we don't have that. <laughs> That's and there, true. there yeah. is no, there is no test. Um, and remember, I could kill the organism that's causing the disease, but as soon as my horse goes back out on that pasture and is re-exposed, he's going to develop antibodies again. So just doing a blood test doesn't tell us whether the horse has been cleared of the infection. Unless I take him off the pasture and never let him see another possum infected, you know, bale of hay or uh, corner of pasture again, he's going to be positive. So getting a blood test, that's why I say a blood test alone, yeah, he's been exposed. Does he necessarily have the disease? I don't know, it's just a blood test. Do a spinal tap. Now I'm finding antibodies actually in and around the spinal cord. That suggests that the organism has actually entered the spinal cord and is causing the disease because that's where the antibodies are being produced. So. If I get a positive spinal tap or one that has far higher antibodies in the spinal fluid than I find in the blood, I'm very suspicious of an active infection. But just doing an antibody titer or antibody level, I can't use that to say when they've been when the organism has been completely eradicated because the problem is unless I put my horse in a bubble or ship him to one part of the United States where he'll never see another possum again, he's always going to have some antibodies. And so sadly, there's not one test that I can rely on to say, nope, every organism is gone. Don't have that. Oh, wow. Well, so we have some great I know, questions. I wish I, I did. Know. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? That would be, the, that would be the, the best answer, I think, for every single person that, was, that had some concerns about or has dealt with the, the few that were, the few, the quite a few that were on here that, uh, had dealt with EPM mm -hmm. themselves. Um, I think that's a question I've heard too. Is is that you know I wish that there was an answer for that. Um, we actually did. And I, I thought I talked. For, go ahead. Yeah. No, and I, I think that's why a lot of those treatments say go for a month, like Marquee or Protozoa. But I think that's where your veterinarian is going to be intuitive. They're going to do the exam. Mm -hmm. They're going to follow the horse along. Now the drugs last for a very long time. So even if I stop protozil today, that drug level will linger for quite a long period of time after the last dose. But that said, some horses may be treated for two to three months because the feeling is they're still getting better, they're still getting better, so I don't want to stop treatment because I don't want to set them up for a relapse. But it's a lot of it is just experience dealing with this disease. 
And that's where you really need to kind of work with your veterinarian and be very observant. Has your horse fully recovered? Has he stopped improving? Um, and so you want to spend time. You know, if you're treating a horse, you want to take him out and walk him around and, and get to know how he moves and ask him to do little things like, ooh, walk up and down a hill or walk over uneven ground. That's where he's going to make mistakes. Even if he looks good, you know, just walking down the shed row where, hey, anybody can probably walk a straight line when the ground's <coughs> even. It's when it's really, you know, bumpy or up and down. That's where you'll find those subtle mistakes. And so it's it's a... It's teamwork. It's a really observant owner and periodic vet exams to help decide, have we treated long enough? But I wish I could tell you there's a blood test that will tell you for sure, and, and we just don't have that. But, you know, I've got horses that if I, he has neurologic disease, I draw a blood test, and he's negative and has no antibodies against sarcocystis or neospora, then chances are his neurologic signs are not due to EPM. But he's also in a minority. As you know, the national average is 79, 80%. So. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. Uh, OK. Um, and actually, while, while we were talking, so I thought if I talked for a minute, we might see if there were any straggling questions. Um, someone asked, uh, is there current research being done um, in regards to UPM? It sounds like with what you were saying with, with Merck, is that it's ongoing research. Yes. We are, and, and we're looking at what people had asked, you know, is there a way to prevent it? Um, and so we're, we're looking. Uh, I mentioned in the past there had been a vaccine available, but there is none now. Um, and a tricky organism that came on the market uh, for about five years. That's about the time you have where you've got preliminary data, and if you can't prove that it really is fully protective, then you don't get a full license, and that's what happened with the past vaccine. So, yes, we're, we are working with this organism. And actually, we've had research meetings. Um, it was all, oh, back in the late 1990s, early 2000s. We had used to have them fairly frequently. We hadn't had one for about ooh, 12, 14 years. Just had one in Kentucky a couple years ago, and I was just told we're having another research uh, kind of get together um, next year, and it'll probably be out in California. So they'll bring in everyone who's been working on this disease. So it's not going away, and we're not giving up on it. Yeah, good. Um, and then uh, is, is there an uh, issue with, um, which, you know, breeding a mare that is showing signs of EPM? Um, Not breeding per se. We prefer, obviously, if I'm going to breed a mare, I prefer she not be on any unnecessary medication. Mm -hmm. And so if I thought I had a mare with EPM, I would want to treat her and feel that I have you know, cleared the infection or she's as good as she's going to get. I prefer she not be on uh, treatments. If I have to treat a mare who is pregnant, I would choose either protozil or marquee. Neither one is got you know, the safety claim in pregnancy, but we do know that rebalance, the ingredients that are in rebalance, have caused problems in unborn foals. And so we have seen problems with their bone marrow, and we've seen problems with the development of the kidneys and foals. So I, I would not use rebalance, which is pure methamine and sulfa uh, diazine, and I would not use that in a pregnant mare. Breeding a mare that has had EPM, um, we talked about stress and immunosuppression. And late pregnancy is a very stressful and immunosuppressive event. And so as a mare enters her last trimester, um, she becomes more susceptible to a lot of things. And you really need to be very careful where your late-term mare goes and who she's exposed to. And so I would say there is always the potential that if she's got an organism that's dormant and she's bred and she gets into late pregnancy, we have had instances where they have started to show signs again. But I've also known many mares that had a history of EPM, went on and had many happy pregnancies. But I definitely would not be breeding a mare I was treating 
3 p.m. I'd want her through all of her drug therapy, if at all possible. Okay. Um, and last one, they're, they're, uh, they, they think we're going to be um, uh, gone, uh, leaving, because they've got lots of questions. Um, it, and, and I'm guessing I probably know the answer to this, but I just figured it would be a good one to, to answer for those that are curious. Um, is a prescription necessary for the protozil? Um, we, we prefer it come from your veterinarian. Um, I know there are probably places you can purchase it, but it is a prescription drug, and so you probably are going to need a prescription to purchase it wherever you see it. And I would prefer it come through your veterinarian because to me that says you've gone through the physical, the neuro exam, and you're pretty comfortable. Uh, maybe a spinal tap, you're pretty comfortable that's what you're treating. So it's not something you're going to walk into a feed store and find Marquee or Prodigil yeah. or Rebalance. It will need a prescription. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I know we keep having more people think of other stuff and and uh, have more questions. And I know you had said uh, you didn't mind if people emailed you. If you do have further yeah. questions, um, we can. You are welcome to send your questions uh, via um, the. the Excuse me. The survey, there we go, couldn't get it out, it's getting late. Uh, the survey is, that comes up after it, they're welcome to send in their, uh, current, their extra questions via the survey, and um, our webinar director, okay. Elizabeth Smith, at the um, office, okay. can forward them on to you, Dr. Valla, and uh, let you answer those if people have further questions, because I'm pretty sure they will. They keep thinking of more on here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, right. I figured you would. Good. As we talked the other day, I figured there would be a lot of questions that I couldn't even begin to guess what the questions would be. Um, and uh, otherwise, I think I know I learned a lot more about EPM than I already knew. I studied it in college, but it's been about <laughs> 10 years since I've dealt with it, fortunately for me, unfortunately for some people um, that have had to deal with it. Um, so I think that looks like it's about it. Um, just want to say thank you again to Merck Animal Health for sponsoring these webinars. I know that uh, we greatly appreciate it at Pony Club. And thank you, Dr. Valla. It's been quite an informative, wonderful webinar. And well, good. with that, I think we will call it a night. Hopefully your weather gets better up there. Uh, we haven't experienced that down here in Kentucky yet, and I don't want to. <laughs> so uh, No, not at this temperature, trust me. <laughs> no, nope, no, nope. All right, well, thank you again, and everyone have a wonderful evening. And if you'd like to see the webinar again, it will be posted by tomorrow on the Pony Club website. So thank you. Very good. Thank you for having me. All right.